much. And uh, welcome to my talk. I'm really excited to be here. This is not only my first time at an uh, OVAS AppSec conference, but also my very first time as a speaker. So I'm really curious where this will go and how it, is, how it will go. Um, my talk will be about the insecurity of JavaScript object signing and encryption, or just in short, Josie, which is um, basically uh, the results of my master's thesis at the Ruhr University in Bochum. And um, yes, just as a short introduction, my name is Dennis Detering. I'm working as a penetration tester at the CSPI in Cologne, in Germany. And um, those three guys at the bottom were my supervisors, and um, they, they helped me a lot and supported me and answered tons of, uh, tons of, of mails um, I, I uh, sent to them to ask them for uh, to ask any questions um, during my research and during my math thesis. So thank you very much for helping me. And um, yeah, that's why I'm now standing here and presenting our results. What you might expect from today's talk is um, basically this. So I will give a short and quick introduction um, to what the JSON web family basically is. And then I will show you some practical attacks and vulnerabilities which is uh, signature exclusion, key confusion, the Bleichenbacher million message attack, and if we have enough time, also a timing attack on uh, certain libraries. And then I will introduce our developed Burp Suit extension with the name Joseph to um, help testing those libraries, and then just a short um, yeah, summary and, and uh, outlook. So let's get started. What's, what is Josie? Um, does anybody of you already know Josie or the JSON web family? Just stand up. Two, three, five. Cool. So just very quick, um, JSON or Josie is um, all in all a, um, are all in all five RFC standards, which got the proposed standard status in May 2015. So they are quite new, quite young. And uh, the main goal is basically to be really, really simple, especially compared to XML encryption and XML signatures. And they were designed to be um, URL safe. So they have a so-called um, compact serialization representation, which uses base64 URL encoding, so that you're able to use it um, within the URL itself as a uh, query parameter. And they were designed to be used in space constrained environments, so they're really kept small, you will see that later, so that they can also be used in uh, HTTP authorization headers or um, yeah, within the URL itself. And another good thing is that they are um, self-contained, so they can be used in stateless protocols like HTTP, and every information you need um, is inside this token. Um, why those standards might be quite good or will be used even more in the future is because, on the one hand, people from big companies are working out. So it's um, people from Google, from Microsoft, and from Cisco. And the, the standards were already implemented in um, quite early in really well-known protocols and um, products, like, for example, in the ACMA protocol for Let's Encrypt, for the um, automatic uh, certificate issuance. They're used as um, authentication mechanism for Atlassian add-ons, and they are already used um, in, in SSO protocols like OpenID Connect. So what are those uh, standards? The first one is JSON Web Algorithm, which basically um, describes and specifies which algorithms can be used with uh, the signatures and with the encryption, and which additional parameters are necessary um, if you want to use those algorithms. The second one is JSON Web Key, which is simple as specification of how to what is going on there, of how to um, represent a cryptographic key in a JSON-based format. So here on the right side, there is an example of a JSON Web Key set. So it's containing multiple um, keys. Uh, the upper one is uh, is an a, um, elliptic curve public key, and the the bottom one is an RSA public key. So that everything is in a JSON-based format. The JSON web signature is um, a specification of, um, of how to integrity protect um, arbitrary messages in a JSON-based format. 
with, for example, digital signatures or um, message authentication codes. And this snippet at the bottom is basically the result of such a uh, JSON web signature. So this is really, really short, really, really um, simple. And it's, um, it, it's always um, built up with uh, three parts. So there's the header at the top. Then comes our payload, which is, which is our message. And then comes the extra signature at the end. Um, to show you even, or to make it even easier to understand, I try to visualize it a bit and um, in a not encoded format. So we have our um, header, which uh, basically contains all the metadata, all the um, cryptographic information about this token, as in this case, which algorithm we used. This is then base64 URL encoded and um, is our first part. Then we have our payload, our message, which is also a JSON object. And, um, so in a key value format, as in this case, it, and in this case it contains um, my name, my university, and a um, master's degree flag. This is also base64 URL encoded and then simply concatenated with a period together, um, which is then used as input for our uh, signature or MAC function. In our example, we uh, selected the HMAC with SHA-256 and the key secret. So we're taking this, um, this first output as input to our function. The result is our signature, which uh, also gets base64 URL encoded, simply again concatenated at the end with a period, and this is our final result of a um, fully valid JSON web signature token. Um, this is really easy, especially compared to XML signatures. I don't know if you are familiar with that. They have to do a lot of transformation, a lot of wrapping, and it's, it's really, really complex and, and crazy stuff going on there. Um, a little more complex, but also quite simple, is the JSON web encryption. As the name might indicate, it's used for um, encryption. <laughs> and um, this token uh, contains five parts. So there we have again our header with the, all the cryptographic information. Then comes the encrypted key, which is also known as a session key or content encryption key. So it's just like you do um, yeah, secure communication, you're having a symmetric key for the actual uh, encryption and then you're using your asymmetric key to, um, to transport that uh, symmetric key in a secure way. Then the third part is the initialization vector if needed for your selected algorithm. Um, then comes the cipher text and in certain algorithms we also have the authentication tag which is some additional integri integrity protection um, if you select uh, authenticated encryption algorithms. Uh, yeah. Again, some, some nice picture to visualize it a bit. We have our header, which um, yeah, contains the algorithms we want to use, and then gets base 64 URL encoded. We generate our session key for the actual encryption, and then use our recipient's public key. In this case, it's RSA to encrypt this session key. We have our actual plain text we want to hide to provide confidentiality, live long and prosper. Um, then we have our initialization vector. And um, optionally, you can use also so called additional authenticated data. This might be used, um, yeah, this is simply input you can use to integrity protect, but which gets not encrypted itself. In this case, this is the header, so this is not some some um, yeah, information you want to hide, but you want to keep sure that it's um, integrity protected and nobody messed around with that. Um, all that, that components are then used as input for your encryption function, and as output you get on the one hand the cipher text and on the other hand the authentication tag. And the final result is then our, again our, um, yeah, our JSON web encryption token with the five parts base64 URL encoded. Last but not least, the JSON Web token. Um, this specification basically describes the uh, yeah, some some so-called claims, so assertion, assertions about a subject you might use but you don't have to use. 
Um, for example, the ISS is the issuer, so who, uh, who created this token? The IAT issued at, not developed before, expiration, and those are simply um, best practices or options you might use to protect against replay attacks or um, you should use if you want to use this token as session token, for example. So that was really quick and really much. I hope I have not yet lost you. Um, because now comes the interesting part, the attacks and the vulnerabilities we tried to um, um, apply, we, we analyzed. The first one is the signature exclusion. So this is a list of possible algorithms to use for JSON web signatures. Um, yeah, on, the, on the top there is the there's the HMIC algorithms um, we try, we used in our example, then RSA. And at the very bottom, there's a algorithm um, called none. This is quite suspicious. And if you're uh, looking at the description there, it says that no digital signature or MAC is performed at all. So this, this is right, quite strange. Um, if we keep in mind that we are looking at a specification for signatures for integrity protection. And uh, this algorithm has been added for scenarios and systems where um, the protection is done by other means. So let's say if you have a direct server-to-server -server connection um, with a um, TLS channel and you don't need to be to the message itself to be um, protected again, then you might use uh, this algorithm and still can use the same libraries and the same JSON format. But there is obviously some problem with that. Um, if we have such a token, which is validly signed using HMAC, what would you do as an attacker? Any guesses? Correct. You simply change the algorithm value to none, strip away the signature, and there were many, many, many um, libraries out there who still, uh, yeah, who did not check whether the none algorithm should be allowed or not, and simply um, yeah, validated the signature correctly. This was first discovered by um, Tim McLean, who then um, informed a lot of uh, library maintainers, and they uh, tried to fix it. And uh, we wanted to know how such a um, vulnerability occurs and, and how they try to fix it and analyze those libraries. And this is one example of that. Uh, in version 2.1.3, um, they added a allow unsecure flag, which was set to false by default, which is quite good. So if you're using it as a developer, you, have, you don't have to um, yeah, read through all the documentation beforehand um, to be secure. And they also added um, this uh, if condition, so if the algorithm header is none and our allow unsecure flag is set to false, then we're throwing an exception saying, okay, um, this cannot be validated in a secure context. But there is some, uh, some more code uh, um, below. This is the snippet over here, this one, um, which takes the algorithm value and then searches for a class with this name. So if you have HMAC, it searches for the class HMAC. If this class exists, it's uh, initiating a new instance and performing the actual validation. And if not, it's throwing an exception claiming, okay, this is not a valid algorithm. If we go back again, oh no, um, if we take a look at the um, PHP documentation, there is a sentence which says, okay, the class name is matched in a case insensitive manner. Which means, um, yeah, we can use, we can maybe mess around with it. If you go back and look at the actual comparison, this is a native string comparison, which is typing safe, good in the context of PHP, but it's a very simple uh, string comparison. And if we note as an attracker, simply try different capitalizations, we can bypass this, um, yeah, this additional um, feature, this additional check, and uh, create our, our valid um, signature tokens again. Um, and this was, uh, the, the maintainers were informed, and this was fixed in version 5 or something, 5.02, I think. So quite, quite, quite late. 
our second attack is the key confusion attack, which is a quite interesting one. Um, it was also, again, first discovered by Tim McLean, um, that many libraries use verification functions with that specific um, yeah, API, with this specific format over here. So they are calling the verification function and um, um, providing the, as the token as string and as the first parameter and the verification key as second parameter, also as string. So in systems um, where you want to use symmetric um, cryptography, you're providing the token as first parameter and then the HMAC secret, which should be private, as second parameter. In systems uh, using asymmetric uh, signatures like RSA, you're again providing the token as first parameter and then the RSA public key as second parameter. So there are quite a few problems with that. Um, the first one is, how does the system determine the, the use algorithm? So the, the, the header is um, user controlled. So there it says, okay, use the algorithm HMAC in this case, but we as an attacker can manipulate it. And um, the second problem is the use of so-called primitive obsession. So complex um, data structures are represented as primitive data types, as in this case, it's a cryptographic key represented as simple string. And how can we exploit it um, in systems where the token is signed or where the system expects a token signed with RSA, but receives a token uh, which was signed using HMAC, the, the system uh, will think that the public key is actually the HMAC secret key. So we can use some public information um, to be used as private secret key. Um, let's have some beautiful picture again, um, how such an attack scenario might look like. So we as an attacker obtain the RSA public key, which as the name says is public. Um, then we generate our token using the HMAC algorithm and we're using our public key in a string representation as um, a secret key. Then we're sending this um, malicious token to the, to the service. The service is uh, calling the verification function and because it's expecting um, an, an asymmetrically signed token, it's um, yeah, calling the function by providing the token as first parameter and the RSA public key as second parameter. Um, the underlying library, however, um, takes a look at the algorithm header within the token itself. And there it says, okay, this is HMAC, um, then I perform my HMAC verification. It's simply taking the second parameter, which in this case is the RSA public key, and then uh, performing the HMAC algorithm to create its own signature and compare both signatures if they're the same. And of course, as we as an attacker did it the same way, both signatures are the same, and we again have um, yeah, a validly signed token, but we are in control, in control of how to sign it. And I will show you um, some, some, some good examples in a demonstration later. Our third attack, um, now focusing on the uh, encryption part, is the Bleichenbacher Milli message attack, um, which is quite more complex. Um, it was described first in 1998 by Daniel Bleichenbacher, and he applied it to SSL in version 3. Um, and it focused or ex it exploited the PKCS 1.5 <coughs> padding format uh, within the um, RSA encryption scheme. And since then, uh, many others uh, did their research and applied it to other protocols and other standards as well, and also improved it and made it a lot faster. Like, for example, they, um, some researchers applied it to XML encryption in 2012, so almost 15 years later, and they were able to recover the session key, and with that, able to um, decrypt the hidden content. And then again, in 2012, um, it, was, um, it was possible to break PKCS 11 with it. And even in 2016, TLS, uh, or a version of the Bleichenbacher attack, was used to um, break TLS. So um, the RSA with PKCS 1.5 algorithm is known to have quite some problems. 
but why should we expect that uh, such an algorithm um, is not part of a quite new specification? So this is also one of the recommended uh, algorithms again in the JSON web encryption standard. And uh, we tried cool. Uh, we, we thought cool. Let's let's try um, if anything has changed and if um, the libraries are, are vulnerable again or not. Just in short, how this attack works because it's really quite complex. It's a um, it's classified as adaptive chosen ciphertext attack. So we as an attacker um, are able to send different ciphertext to the system and get a response and based on this response we can um, yeah, measure or observe any differences in occurring er errors or in the timing consumption. Um, the um, PKC is 1.5 format has this specific format so the uh, first two bytes are fixed 00 and 02 then comes a random padding string um, this is separated by a null byte and then comes our actual message. And what we do as an attacker is we are abusing or exploiting the system as a so-called padding oracle. So um, we're observing error messages and timing um, differences to see whether this format um, was valid or not. And this can be done because of um, a malleability of the RSA encryption scheme, uh, which is called binding. So if we have a um, given valid ciphertext by sniffing or in a forum blog post or something, um, we are able to generate our own integer s and by using this mathematical equation, so using um, it to the power of e, uh, to the power to e, which is publicly known, um, we can, we are able to create a, at the end, a valid plain text in, in, in the context of RSA. Um, yes, yeah, so there's quite some crazy math going on within the original paper of Leichenbacher, so there's a lot of formulas and it took me like weeks to understand even a bit of it. Um, so I will not go into detail um, yeah, of that now, but um, I, will, I have included in, um, in the demonstration later to see uh, how, what you can do um, in real life with, um, yeah, with this attack. Um, even if the math behind it is quite complex, it's, it's, yeah, if you are able to see the source code, if you're performing a source code audit or um, analyzing open source libraries, it's quite easy to see in the code because um, as a developer you want to um, check every single step of your decryption function, for example, and you want to provide detailed error messages if something went wrong. Um, which is quite good, but might be bad in a cryptographic context. So if we're throwing um, very, very detailed exceptions at the wrong locations, we as an attacker um, yeah, can, con can observe and learn if the uh, padding format was valid or not. And the attack scenario is simple. We need one simple ciphertext in, in most cases. Um, and then if we're able to send our own modified ciphertext to the server and get a response we can observe, then we're able to um, use this attack to um, exploit the service. Our fourth attack, timing attack, um, is also really easy to see if you're able to see the source code, but it's quite, quite challenging to exploit in, in real life because you need to uh, measure quite precisely the, the timing consumption. But there are a lot of papers um, of how to practically, uh, practically abuse and exploit it. So um, in code, this is um, a PHP example, it's basically a comparison of, the, of two signatures. Just as you will do it, um, taking the uh, signature you got, generating your own signature and then comparing if both are the same. Um, in order to understand how such a timing attack might work, you need to know the, how the underlying um, comparison function works, which for a PHP is the C mem compare function. And what it does, it simply takes both strings, it's iterating through every character 
of both strings, and as soon as the first character is different, it returns saying, okay, those strings are not, are not equal. This is really good in terms of performance. So if you have two really, really long strings and they um, already differ at the beginning, then you don't have to check all the other characters. But in terms of cryptography, there's quite an issue with this because we can, um, by measuring the time consumption, we can learn at which, at which specific position um, the difference occurred. So just to give you an example, this is, um, yeah, these are the results of our measuring. Um, at the at the top, we have our um, our hash or our signature, which is not known to us, and then we're sending uh, different signatures where only the the first byte or the first character differs. So iterating all possible bytes, and we can by by performing a lot of samples. I think this example um, is. We took 10 million examples or 10 million uh, requests to measure. Um, we can see that at the valid byte, which in this case is seven, we can um, observe a slightly higher timing consumption. And this is because um, the comparison function um, checked, okay, those are, those are correct, and then continued to the second iteration of the, of the, of the for loop and all the others simply uh, returned saying, okay, those are not equal. And this can be used by an attacker to step-by-step step, um, yeah, calculate your own valid signature to, without knowing the cryptographic key. Again, a lot of theory. Um, now I'd like to introduce our developed uh, web suite extension called Joseph which stands for JavaScript Object Signing and Encryption Pen Testing Helper. Um, and who of you uh, uses and, or knows um, the Burp Suite regulatory? That's quite a lot, it's cool. So hopefully you will um, like this extension and use it in your, in your tests. And you can now download it from our repository or simply, if you're quick enough, um, scan the QR code so you don't have to type all the URL. And um, in order to make sure that there's a lot of things that might possibly go wrong, in my first presentation, I decided to do it in a live demo. Um, I think that's more interesting than just giving some more slides. So there's our web suite. There's our extension, Joseph, loaded in a separate tab. Can you see it somehow? Do it this way. Maybe a little better. Okay. So, if you load it, there's not that much to see. Simple, some tabs which has manual, decoder, preferences, help. Um, I will not go into detail into this now because um, yeah, I think the attacks are more interesting. I also um, created a very very basic demo application which is simple a simply a login mask, and it's loading, that's good. Um, I will first try the forgot password feature, and this is a real life scenario because um, yeah, I, I already saw it in the wild that, uh, that there are services and applications using it. If you click on the forgot password, um, it's asking us for, for a username. Okay, so we're giving our username, saying submit, and it's saying, okay, reset link has been set to your email address. That's as you should do it. There is the email, <laughs> and um, it's, it's containing a, a link, and there we can already see that there's a, a quite long a token appended to the URL. If you're calling this, or requesting this URL now, it says, hi Dennis, set your password, set your new password. So there, um, yeah, there happened some kind of authentication or verification that I am the user Dennis. If we now go back to our, our Burp Suite extension or our Burp Suite in general, we can observe that um, our request got marked or got highlighted. Um, this is already done by our extension, so it's it's trying to find JSON web tokens, which might be a signature or an encryption. And then it's um, it's highlighting this request. Um, if you 
checked the, the box in the preferences. And it's also additionally um, giving a content whether this was a, a web signature or a web encryption. Then we can click on this request and see an additional um, editor called JWS. And there all the um, separate components are split up and where feasible also decoded so that we can um, already see what, what is the plain text of this. So in this case, okay, this is an HMAC um, token. We have our payload saying, okay, issuer, AppSec demo, user ID two. This might be interesting. Then we have an action and an issued at timestamp uh, and the actual signature at the end. So what we now can do is simply send it to the repeater and see, click go again. Okay, same request, it's saying hi Dennis, set your new password, so far so good. If you now try to um, mess with the payload, let's say we want to become user number one, which is hopefully admin, and click and go. It says, oh, error invalid token. So there's actually some verification on the server side, which is good. Um, there is an additional context menu saying send to Joseph if you click on the highlighted request. And then there's an additional um, attacker tab on our Joseph tab. Uh, there um, all available attacks are, um, yeah, are shown and you can select which attack to, um, to use to try. In this case we want to try signature exclusion because I know that is working. We click on load and then we get some um, additional information like in this case a short description of what the um, attack actually is and what it exploits. And um, depending on the attack, we maybe need to provide some more, um, some more information like the public key, we we'll see later. If we then click on attack, then another window opens which has the look and feel of the intruder. So we see simply um, different, different requests so with different payloads we send and um, also the status code, the length of the response, etc. So if we look, for example, at the, this one with the algorithm none, you can also see it in the editor. So the algorithm none was used and the signature was cut away just as explained in our, um, in our attack scenario. Then we get as response, okay, error invalid token. But if we take a look at the other requests, there's a, a difference in the response lengths. So um, let's take a look what it says. There it says again, hi Dennis, set your new password. So um, even by using the different algorithm, we were able to um, yeah, validly perform this request, which is good for us as an attacker. So this payload seems to work. We can now send this again to the repeater. Try it again. Hi Dennis, set your new password. Okay, that's working. And if we now mess around with the pay payload, saying, okay, now I'm user one, trust me following the request, there it is, hi admin, set a new password, and we are now able to um, set a password for every user within the system. And by skipping the first step of sending the actual email for the password reset, we are even able to change the password without the user being notified. So this was our first attack. Our second attack is, um, let's say we have a valid account on this service and we do log in. Then it says, hi Dennis, your role is user, which is quite good. Um, this time there's no um, token within the, within the URL as um, query parameter, so we're going back again to our extension and there's another highlighted request. Um, we go to the raw tab there, we can see, okay, this time this uh, token has been issued as cookie, as session cookie. And then we can observe again that there is, um, that the um, header contains the algorithm, in this case, uh, RSA was used, and as payload we have now, okay, again the issuer, a username, and an admin flag. Can again send this to, the, to our repeater, Okay, this is still working. If we now mess around with the payload, 
we want to become admin, of course, set the flag to true, and saying, okay, you're not authorized to view this page. So again, there's some verification. As we learned, we can try the um, signature exclusion attack by using different capitalization of the NAND algorithm. We can simply cut away the signature and hit go, and oh, we're still not authorized to view this page. So a signature exclusion um, cannot be applied here. So we're again sending this request to our extension and now choose the key confusion as attack. We load it and again there's some description and it's asking for a public key. As a public key is usual public, we can uh, search, search the server and see the uh, jwk.json which is an RSA public key. Um, this is a raw format. We simply copy that and provide this to our attack engine and hit attack. Uh, this is not a valid PAM format, this is correct because we support both the PM and the uh, JSON web key format. We select JSON web key and we can perform the attack. And again, we can um, sort by length to see any differences in the responses. And um, there are quite um, some requests were performed in the background, so we have around, I think, 12 transformations of the public key to um, really match the, the used uh, string representation as used uh, on the server. Um, yeah, if we simply check this one, okay, not authorized, not authorized, and payload number OC has a different length, and there the response seems to be valid, it's saying, hi Dennis, your role as user. That's pretty good, so this payload seems to work. If we now send it to our repeater again, um, we can again um, change the payload, set our admin flag to true, just check it, okay, it's not valid. Then we have an additional attack attack over here. And then we simply choose the same um, attack we tried, give it our public key, and then we have to choose the payload which worked, which was um, transformation 12 or OC. And if we now click on update, uh, in the background the signature is created, and we can now click again on go, perform the request, and there it says, hi Dennis, you're now an admin. And we, uh, with this attack, we now um, escalated our privileges in the, in the system. Last but not least, the Bleichenbacher attack. So there's a um, service which simply um, takes a encrypted token and um, then says, okay, that right, it, it was success, successful or not. Um, if we go back to our extension again, it's again highlighted and we have another um, editor tab where all the five parts of the, of the JSON web encryption are now shown. Um, there the RSA PKC is 1.5 algorithm was used, which is good for us. And um, yeah, the other um, parts are not, not decoded because that would result in, in garbage. If we now send it to our extension, um, we are only able to select the Bleichmacher the message attack. So it's already uh, recognizing, okay, this is JSON web signature or in encryption, and it knows which, um, which attack might be applied to it or not. Again, if you load it, there's some description, and um, then it's asked for the public key again. This time we are using an RSA public key in the PM format to show you that both formats are supported and we're performing the attack. Um, this one is a little different to the other ones because um, now uh, we have to um, manually review the requests and build our um, petting oracle. So we have to um, yeah, review uh, whether the PKC is one format was correct or not. That's simply information gathering beforehand or a, a guessing. And um, there we can see different errors. So expected key length was wrong. Um, the description failed or anything. So we are performing several payloads to, to check whether we can determine any differences. And if we check those, those requests, I now know which ones are valid and which are not. So 
basically those two um, indicate that the padding format was not correct, then we built our padding oracle and can use the second tab to perform the actual attack, which is now using the Bleichenbacher mathematical formulas in the background to send all these, um, these requests um, and performing the attack. And because I'm short in time, I let it run in the background and finish with my slides. Those are not that much. Oops. So a simple um, a conclusion um, or our contribution. On the one hand, the main contribution is our Burp suit extension. Um, I hope that helps you. Then um, we were able to help fixing all in all six libraries of different uh, languages, and PHP, Python, Ruby, and C, and got quite some CVs for that. And it was really nice to work together with the um, developers because all of them responded within like 24 hours and, and already uh, also fixed uh, all their issues within 24 or 48 hours. So it was quite, quite nice to work with them. Um, and as a short conclusion, the standard is not perfect, but the main problem is actually the implementations. Uh, and we definitely, as a security community, have to look into it and um, have to help uh, improving it and making it secure. And of course, um, we would like, if you use the Joseph extension and improve it, um, like in uh, this example, I think two months ago, yes, in March, there was the, uh, it got media traction that um, some libraries um, are vulnerable to the envelope curve attack. So this is definitely one attack we want to add to the uh, verb suit extension as well. Um, now let's see if the attack finished. Not yet, but it's taking only some seconds, I guess. Um, there we can see that different S values were found. So as soon as we, uh, the attack found one S value, which uh, created a, um, a valid padding at the end, at the server, then it can use this S value to generate other S values and then um, step by step find out um, or, or step by step decrease the um, possible interval within the where the actual message is contained in and um, yeah, recover the original message. It's taking some more seconds. I hope that's okay. It's already fun to see those those numbers flowing around there. Uh, I think five more seconds or something. Come on, Joseph. You can do it. Yes, and there it got the... Um, it was able to thank you. It was able to um, recover the used session key, and then it's uh, looking at the header again, which um, actual algorithm was used to uh, encrypt the content. It's using the session key to decrypt the um, hidden message, and then it's also sh showing the message, which says, "Okay, password AppSec rocks," and um, some meta information just for debugging. Um, yes, that was basically it. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're a little short in time here, so uh, just one or two questions. For the timing attack, um, network latency doesn't matter a lot. Pardon? Network latency for timing attack. Uh, that was one reason why we did not include the timing attack into the burp suit extension because in order to measure the timing differences that precisely you need special hardware and you need to be able to configure your, your system um, like really, really in depth and that it's not possible as, as Java application within the PubSuite extension. So the timing attack, unfortunately, is um, the only attack of those four which is not included in the PubSuite extension. One more, possibly? 
No, that's good. Well, well if anyone w- wants to uh, converse with Dennis, they can afterwards, but we're short of time, so we'll have to cut it here. Uh, again, thanks very much, folks. Uh, and again, could you please uh, vote as you're going out there um, or internally there? Uh, Blue, obviously, um, if you find that informative. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you, Thank Dennis. Thank you very much.